Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this investor webinar for Amero International Limited. Uh, my name's Gabriella. I'm the IR advisor for Amero. Uh, before I hand over to Hank um, for his presentation, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded and a copy will be posted to the ASX as well as Amero's website. Um, following Hank's presentation today, we will also be taking questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could please raise your hand and I'll unmute you uh, to ask the question live. Otherwise, if you'd prefer to submit a written question, please do so via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Okay, um, over to you, Hank. Great, thank you, Gabby. Good afternoon, everyone. As a follow-up to the announcement lodged on Friday, we want to host an investor briefing with Q&A. To start, I thought I would pose and address questions that would be top of my mind as an investor. In December, Amiro announced a binding joint venture with Rob Don Industries, an affiliate of Upmar Holdings in Abu Dhabi. At a high level, it was communicated that the JV would enable a $300 million flagship project that would include seven atomizers for titanium alloy and other specialty alloy powder production, an added manufacturing commercialization center, and large format 3D printing, that Rob Don would fund 50% of the working capital, that Rob Don would directly fund or indirectly secure funding for 100% of the CapEx, and that Rob Don would be a 50% partner and have exclusivity in the Middle East. So what happened? Bottom line, I made a mistake. It's a misjudgment. What was a mistake, misjudgment? Our conviction to the UAE was not a mistake in my mind, and I feel this strongly. And our affiliation with Etmar Holdings was not a mistake. But its newly created partnership, Rob Don Industries, and the inner workings of its internal partnership proved to be a governance mess, and there wasn't delegated authority to be a well-functioning partner. As this became more apparent, we took decisive action, and we moved to terminate the JV agreement. Muhammad al Daeri at Etmar Holdings continues to support Amera, and we anticipate ongoing and continued collaboration. So should Amera be added to the long list of companies who promised riches from the Middle East and ultimately scrapped their plans? No, I don't expect this to be the case. Amera is fundamentally different. Most companies take a few flights to the Middle East with plans of opportunistically taking money and making headlines, underscore take. In Amera's case, number one, myself, the chairman CEO, and affiliate Pegasus Growth Capital invested $7.8 million at 21 cents a share in May, an additional 8.5 million in the December rights offering. A total of $16.3 million has been invested Pegasus owns 164 million fully paid ordinary shares, or approximately 40% of Amero shares, of which I personally have acquired 83 million shares, or approximately 20%. Number two, we've canceled the prior announced project in Australia. I relocated Abu Dhabi, and I'm solely dedicating my time and efforts to deliver on the UA project. Number three, Amero has adopted a strategic plan that closely aligns with the UE's most strategic economic industrialization initiatives. Number four, there's strong interest and support for Mero's project, and we're committed to structuring win-win ventures with UAE-based stakeholders and with strategic partners. The project delivers mutual benefits. It's great for Mero shareholders. It's great for the UAE. It's great for strategic partners. As I've stated on previous occasions with investors, ambitious greenfield projects are never a straight line. I suggested that we were parallel path plan Bs and plan Cs until we greenlighted this project. And I committed that we would not passively sit by for 12 to 18 months and continue to promise a floundering project. We've advanced important deliverables and we've taken decisive corrective actions where necessary. I'm confident we will greenlight the project before June 30th fiscal year end. With a terminated JV, the market seems to have concluded that a financing at discount is imminent. With adjustments for operations, settlement of obligations relating to the Cancel Victoria project, receipt of payment from AMPRO, receipt of R&D credit, Amero will end the March quarter with available cash for approximately $11.6 million. We're sequencing hires and capital expenditures to reduce capital needs prior to the expected installation of the titanium powder production plant in July, 2024. Moreover, we are focused 
on establishing alignment and vested interests with key stakeholders and strategic partners. As such, we do not expect to go to market for financing. We do not have need to imminently raise cash and we expect any near or immediate term financing would be structured with key stakeholders and strategic partners at nil discount. Strategic alignments will be focused on UAE-based stakeholders, as well as partners that bring technical expertise and industry connectivity. On a fully funded, fully diluted basis, we expect the project funding to be less dilutive to Ameris shareholders than the prior announced JV with Robden. Recent ASX release stated that the Kizad build to suit facility won't be completed until June 24. Does this mean that investors should expect to wait a year before anything happens? In effort to be direct and to align expectations, investors should understand that we are not managing this business for quarterly performance. I bring a private equity approach, and this is reflected in our investment rationale, our capital market strategy, our risk management, and our approach to operations. As I have stated before, if investors are looking for a short-term, event-driven profit, I suggest you direct your attention and your investment dollars to other opportunities. We are committing to building long-term value and I'm confident we can achieve more attractive private equity-like returns. I feel the current share price is undervalued and the share price will likely adjust as we deliver on milestones. Over the past several weeks, Amero stock traded down from 17 cents to 10 cents. Why didn't Amero comment? It will not be our practice to comment on market price action, nor on corporate activities that are not advanced and binding. We gave prior guidance we would update investors by the end of March and on the status of the UAE project. As the JV termination agreement was not executed by all parties until Wednesday, 29th of March, it would have been premature to provide an update sooner. Our North Star is to build credibility and trust with investors by communicating in a consistent, direct, unambiguous, transparent and balanced manner. Typically, we would have felt less inclined to give updates on many initiatives that we've advanced in anticipation of green lighting the project. But in order that we communicate in a balanced manner, this seemed appropriate. Finally, given the unsettled nature of the global equity markets and the recent shocks to the banking system in the US and Switzerland, how does this impact our perspective on a metals project in the UAE? As an investor, I incorporate macro thematic views into our investment strategies. As an example, weeks after the COVID shutdown in March 2020, Pegasus acquired a supply chain oriented business from Bain Capital Ventures. Though I was concerned that COVID would have an adverse impact on the global economic and capital market conditions, it seemed evident that businesses driving supply chain efficiency would be big winners. Excuse me. We sold the business to a New York, New York City based private equity firm 23 months later with an 11x return on our investment. As the world emerged from COVID lockdowns, the Ukraine conflict began. I became convinced the world would emerge with a new geopolitical and economic world order. There would be an irreconcilable demarcation of supply chains and that there'd be a strategic imperative to relocate critical manufacturing and critical materials. Supply chain resiliency would be the watchword. Essentially decades of globalization efforts have ended and will turn back. Also, given the undisciplined monetary, sovereign debt, and fiscal policies post-2008 financial crisis, I'm convinced that inflation will be more persistent, that economic growth will be subtrend, and there'll be an inherent loss of confidence in government institutions in the US, in Europe, and in China. This macro view led me to seek investment opportunities that could become a platform to build a large, strategic, advanced manufacturing, advanced materials business. Our strategic plan for Amero is to remake the business into a holding company for interconnected strategic businesses in advanced manufacturing and advanced materials that contribute to supply chain resiliency. As for the UAE, it is the single most exciting, single most promising place in the world. Ambitious forward-thinking investments, younger dynamic leadership, foundational commitment to geopolitical neutrality, stable and respected government institutions, committed to fostering growth with an underpinning based on the rule of law, light regulation, and low taxes. With that, I'm happy to open up to investors for questions, and Gabby, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Hank. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, either raise your hand um, and we'll um, 
address it live or uh, submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, Hank, the first uh, question I've actually got uh, was emailed through from jo uh, investor John Reja. Um, he says, um, I've been an investor in Amero for some years now and every quarter the news flow changes. Um, and looking at last few dates, so on the 12th of December, we said um, we announced the UAE JV um, and uh, in, then we terminated. Um, he sort of says, rather than the merry-go-round of, of different news, can you please just be honest? Tell me in all likelihood on a scale of one to 10, um, if you're confident of the latest proposal succeeding. Um, yeah, that, sorry, that's the end of the question. Well, first of all, I appreciate the direct question and I appreciate, John, the continued confidence. And as I've acknowledged before, as I've experienced firsthand, I understand the frustration. Uh, look, as I said, our North Star is very simple. I have no desire to appease shareholders. I have no desire to oversell what we're trying to do. I have no desire to make promises that I'm not confident we can keep up. At the very same time, speaking very clearly, this will not be a straight line. So to suggest the last quarters have been a continuous of change, um, going back to December to now, again, we're talking about in the context of a, of a single quarter. Um, I don't know a lot more to say. I remain in the UAE. I remain significantly invested. I remain working on those 14 hours a day, seven days a week, all of which I would hope is indicative of my conviction that we will get there. And I'm confident we will. And I feel more strongly than ever that the UAE is the right place for this project and the right place for us to build shareholder value. Uh, if you're asking me what we've described to date, uh, our lease at Kizad, Emirates Development Bank financing, uh, the continued discussions we're having advancing uh, strategic partners here, am I 100% confident it will happen exactly as we've described? The answer is absolutely not. In fact, I'm 100% confident it will not happen exactly as we described. And again, I'm trying to underscore that if investors are particularly focused on a single quarter or the next single event, this is not the right company to invest in. On the other hand, to the extent we've got a management team that is trying to aptly and agilely uh, 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 adjust to giving the highest likelihood that we'll get this project done, and to the extent you've got a company where economic interests are 100% aligned uh, by myself as chairman, CEO, and other shareholders, uh, then I think that is the case. So, you know, on a, on a scale of one to 10, what's my conviction we get there? My conviction is very, very, very high. Uh, you know, my nature is to be cynical. I don't know that I'd ever give anything more than an eight. Um, that being said, I promise you, it will not be a straight line. I promise you we will have to make other adjustments going forward and we'll do so uh, with, uh, again, trying to be very well reasoned, very thoughtful of the facts and the circumstances that we have in mind. I appreciate the frustration. Uh, in no way am I trying to uh, appease uh, nor create an overly strong case to investors. At the very same time, importantly, uh, it's, it, it, we're equally compelled to provide a balanced view. And so I don't want to leave investors with the notion that this has been entirely a negative situation. It's a setback, right? And obviously it has cr created uh, material things that I've had to address and adjust to. Net, net though, we have advanced things on many fronts and I remain very positive about the status of the project and where we are. Thanks, Hank. Um, next question is from Tim Denton. Um, he asked, and, and you referred to, to this in your speech, but um, that Pegasus has a strategy of exiting investments. What is the strategy of exit regarding Amero? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And it's a good, good, good question. And it's an important question. If I'm an investor in this company, right, uh, I want to understand what that exit is. Um, I personally don't really care what the share price is to date. I don't really care what the share price is tomorrow. And thus, to the extent, as I said, that investors are investing with that focus, there's not an alignment of interest. Um, I will not be exiting this company being selling my shares on the open market, right? 
uh, given a small cap stock, it's not practical. What I would expect is over the next three to five years, we will create very significant value in this business. This project alone, if you think about the four atomizers uh, that we've announced with a single project, we've laid out the unit economics of a single atomizer. You're at 105 odd million dollars of revenue. You're at a 26% margin, that margin we've laid out. You put a market multiple on that. And this one project alone is a $750 million asset. Um, what more important though, it will do, it will give us credibility to then go forward with the other projects that we've announced in an effort to vertically integrate the midstream titanium supply chain, melt, mill, et cetera. And now we've got a chance to build a very relevant multi-billion dollar company. How would we exit? The way we would exit, and this is where I think I bring a strength as a, someone that's chairman and CEO of this business, is we will exit via the capital markets. Over time, to the extent we can stand up this portfolio of highly strategic assets, I would anticipate there would be significant interest from an M&A standpoint and or to uh, essentially restructure the listing on a larger exchange at a much larger valuation with additional growth capital. Uh, so my expectation is not that we would exit this investment in one quarter or in three quarters. Thus, I'm not managing this business on a quarterly basis that we'll exit this investment in three to five years. Uh, and that in the end, we will achieve returns akin to what I would find very attractive private equity returns. Okay, thanks, Hank. Um, next set of questions is from Fanola Burke of Russ Group. Um, the first question is, do you anticipate being able to bring the gas atomizer in Germany to the UAE when it was originally ordered for Australia? And can you take us through what needs to happen there? Um, second question, the new facility announced in the Khalifa Economic Zone envisages two gas atomizers for the initial phase. Is there capacity to expand to four gas atomizers and beyond that if necessary? Yes, thanks, Panola. Um, the project that we've announced, and, uh, and Kizad, by the way, just to put this in context for everyone, this is the type of ambitious development that's, that's happening here in the UAE. This is a 550 square kilometer modern, modern, modern industrial park with one of the largest port operations in the world and other intermodal uh, transportation such as rail, airport, et cetera. So this is an incredibly ambitious project. Abu Dhabi Ports or AD Ports that owns Kizad went public December of 21. So a little bit over a year ago. Uh, I want to say their market cap today is on the order of um, 3 billion, if I recall. Um, uh, and Captain Al Shamsi, uh, the CEO of AD Ports has been a great fan of ours and it's been very, very helpful. Turning back to the question, we've worked with them closely to identify a site um, the site will allow for, so the site is on the order of, uh, I go back and forth between uh, English and American standards. The site is on the order of 10 acres. Uh, it will be a two phase development. We will immediately start the first phase, which will be on the order of 10 or 11,000 square meters, 10 or 11,000 square meters, thus 100, 110,000 square feet. It's anticipated that about the time that's finished, we would simply roll the crews to phase two on the same site, which the site has been de uh, designed for. And we would pick up another 12,000 square meters or about 120,000 square feet. Thus in total, about 22,000 square meters or 220,000 square feet thereabout. To put this in context, that's about 10 times the size of what had been announced in Australia. That size, the phase one, it's anticipated would be two gas atomizers. Phase two, it's anticipated would be another two gas atomizers, plus revert or recycling equipment for titanium. One thing I want to add here that's very important, and this is where a, a strategic partner would be interest to us. Uh, we are continuing to look at what is the best technology mix uh, to install in this facility. So we have a straw horse of the four atomizers, four of the single atomizer that we've already built. We know the economics for that. 
we know um, the time to market for that from a qualification period. We know our top line gross margins, our net margins, the throughput. At the very same time, to the extent can technology continues to evolve and there's a better technology or a better fitting complementary technology that we might um, install in phase two, we'll continue to make that evaluation. And we would only do so to the extent it would be accretive to the economics. Now to your specific question, which is very insightful on the uh, export license in Germany. Germany is in fact, one of the more difficult countries in the world, given the post-World War II experience, to get export licenses to non-allied countries, the US and its, its key allies. We are in discussions. Uh, we've retained one of the top law firms in the world, Aiken Gump out of Washington, DC. Uh, that is probably one of the very, very top law firms in the world on international trade export related issues. Uh, we've also um, engaged a well-known consultant in Australia uh, who frequently liaisons with the uh, Australian authorities as well. The direct answer to your question is we do not have an export license from Germany to the UE today. However, let me reframe uh, the question. I don't necessarily want that license today. What do I mean by that? To minimize the working capital need, I want to sequence the installation of my atomizers as closely as possible. Having a single atomizer, which was plan planned in Australia, does not give us sufficient unit economics. Uh, thus, I want to be uh, installing my second atomizers on the heel of my first atomizer being installed, perhaps one quarter later. So now the question becomes, uh, do I go ahead and ship that atomizer to Germany? Uh, we're in conversations right now on the export issues. Uh, there is no guarantee, as I said, given uh, Germany's difficult export environment, though everyone seems to agree it's highly, highly likely this will not be an issue. Uh, there are some questions on exactly the way we go about it directly to the UAE, the other countries, uh, obviously with full transparency, whatever the case may be. The more germane question for me strategically is, though, when do I want to ship that atomizer? And do I want to ship that atomizer essentially at the same time or close to the same time that I ship the second atomizer, which is very likely, again, to minimize my working capital need? And so that's part of what we're standing up right now. Getting Keysight started is the most pressing initiative because even with an expedited process, it's going to be 12 months. So I've got to get that started, get that underway, and then I'll come back to the equipment issue uh, with what's the best sequencing and what's going to be the best mix of equipment. Uh, and this could very likely involve some other strategic discussions that we're having right now. So it's a good question. It's not something that I'm concerned of. Uh, it is something that I'm paying particular attention to. Um, and I think we'll have some strategic opportunities going forward with exactly the way that we uh, both procure and sequence uh, that shipping and installation of equipment. Hopefully that answers the question for the look. Uh, thanks, Hank. Um, quite a few questions on um, what caused the breakdown of the JV and also financing. So a few questions on those lines as follows. Um, can you provide further details about the process of terminating the agreement with Rabdan how ITMAR responded to the termination and what gives you the confidence that you're going to continue to receive their support going forward. In addition, you propose issuing 2% of Amero stock to ITMAR, but, they, but not that they have accepted the offer. Can you provide details around these discussions? And um, last question, um, what is the process or what else is required to secure finance from Emirates Development Bank? Okay, um, Gabby, if I don't, I think there's three questions there. If I miss one of those, please come back and remind me. Sure. Um, the, the first question relating to the JV, and uh, this all happened rather quickly. And one of the things that I promised investors uh, a, a lot of companies come to the Middle East to raise capital or for that matter, go anywhere to raise capital and it drags on, it drags on, it drags on and they continue hoping it will come to. And I gave a promise to investors, we will not do that. Either we'll continue to make demonstrable progress. We will establish key deliverables that we're expecting to deliver and our partners are expected to deliver. 
And to the extent people do not make those key deliverables, uh, that will be a flag that we need to uh, revisit this and potentially make a change. As for the JV, as you recall, the JV agreement was signed in late December. As it was announced, the JV agreement was signed specifically with a company called Rob Don Holdings. Again, as announced, this was a newly formed entity that was affiliated with Etmar Holdings. I'm sorry, it's Rob Don Industries that was familiar with Etmar Holdings. Etmar being a very well-established, very well-known firm uh, in Abu Dhabi. Um, the primary contact, our principal contact at Etmar is Muhammad al Da'eri, um, who is a, a senior contact, um, his, his older brother, Sultan, uh, as well as Ali. Uh, those three essentially make up the, you know, the, the management structure, if you will, of Etmar Holdings. What became clear uh, in our communications post December, they had some deliverables in late January. And when those deliverables were not met in late January, uh, and we began to uh, get more involved, if you will, with the rationale for why these deliverables weren't met, it just became clear that the governance structure of this new venture, uh, Rob Don Industries, um, it was immature. It had not been thought through well. It was Etmar doing business with another company that they had not done extensive business with before. And at the end of the day, we lost confidence uh, in the governance structure of that new entity. We are moving at a very, very quick pace. And as I'm frequently told at meetings uh, here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, it's a pace this region is not accustomed to. And it's a pace that's challenging uh, the conventional standard getting things done here. If I wasn't here on the ground, I have very little confidence uh, that we could advance these initiatives and they would happen. So back to Rob Don. Look, at the end of the day, it, we just weren't going to get there. And if we were gonna get there, it was gonna take much, much longer, which by the way is what they suggested. They thought we would get there, but it would take much longer. And I was unwilling to wait. Uh, clearly we tried to manage the situation with Etmar Holdings to minimize any collateral damage and to assure that we could continue to work with them on a going forward basis, not only in this initial project, but on other projects, the midstream assets in the UAE and potentially the projects in the kingdom. We've had extensive conversations with Mohammed al Dairi, and I'm confident that they remain very supportive. They will remain very supportive. They've communicated that support to key stakeholders, including very recently. Uh, and I look forward to working with that Mark going forward. Um, in the end, as we had described, the true financial commitment they had made was to fund half the working capital directly. Okay, so that half the working capital directly, we will now have to source some other funds and I'm confident we can do so. On the CapEx, uh, as we are always very clear about, they did not intend to directly fund that, but rather secure indirect funding. Uh, many of those introductions they had made or they had supported uh, conversations I had already begun and they continue to do so. Uh, and uh, those conversations are, are well down the road. So on, on the 2% question to wrap up on Etmar, the real question right now we're having with Etmar is, what's the best way to work together going forward? How can they add that local knowledge expertise? How can they help us with the connectivity in Abu Dhabi? Uh, and we're looking at this from a very long-term perspective. Again, candidly, I don't care about this quarter stock price. What I care about is this quarter, we make significant progress on our deliverables. If we do so, if we execute, the stock price will take care of itself. And that's my mindset. I don't watch the stock that closely. What I do watch very closely is every day and every week, the deliverables that we need to make progress on. As it relates to financing, yes, I'm highly confident that we will get there. As I said, I'm equally confident it won't be exactly the way I perceive it to be today. This is an ever moving target. It's a very, very dynamic scenario. And importantly, when we bring on these partners, what I most care about is not the capital. I have relationships in the US that if I wanted to, I could pick up the phone today and have significant capital wired this afternoon to invest in America, period. It's not my objective. My objective is to bring on well-aligned, added value, strategic key stakeholders or key partners 
that will advance this project and maximize the probability that we will be successful, not only standing up this first project, but the downstream ambitions as well. So I'm looking at key stakeholders in the UAE. I'm looking at key partners that bring technical expertise and know-how. I'm looking at key partners that have industry connectivity, both from an offtake side as well as elsewhere in the supply chain. And that's where I anticipate we'll raise capital from. Uh, did I miss any questions, Gabby, or did that largely address it? That largely addressed the questions. Okay. Um, a few more questions coming through. Um, this one's about the, the new directors. So uh, congratulations on the appointment of two well-credentialed directors. Could you provide some insight into the role you see for them with Amero going forward? And second question from the same um, person, 11.6 million in the bank, what's your current cash burn rate? To, uh, and to fund the remaining working capital, are you expecting to issue equity at Amero to a funding partner for the working capital? Okay, again, we got multiple questions here. So please uh, help me, Gabby, if I forget any of these. Let me begin with the board. Um, I, the, the, the way companies compose their board should inform investors about what they view to be strategically important. Okay. And this is a, this is companies have chapters, companies evolve. What I need today and what is strategically important is not the same as what I will need two years from now and what I will consider strategically important. If you look at the board composition today, we've got a strong, strong, strong capital markets focus. OK, as I look at what's most important over the next 12 months, it's going to be delivering on this first project and it's going to be approaching strategic capital market sources and strategic capital market partners as we go forward. And Eric Levy, you've got a very experienced New York based private equity investor, uh, has had extensive experience in Canada as well as in the U.S., um, has been well known for many years to Omer. Uh, Granite, another uh, board member, and so there's, you know, there's a uh, ongoing existing dialogue there, uh, and Eric has been fantastic. Uh, again, very connected in the ecosystem, and someone who's very thoughtful as we think through some of these more strategic oriented uh, questions. Bob Latta, I will tell you, uh, I could count on one hand the people in my life over my entire career that I most respect, most trust, and most admire, one of whom is Bob Latta. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the venture capital ecosystem in the U.S., obviously primarily Silicon Valley, primarily the Palo Alto area, there is one law firm, Wilson Sonsini, that was transformative uh, in the evolution of the entire Silicon Valley slash growth capital ecosystem. Uh, Bob Latta, who went to Stanford for undergraduate in economics and, uh, and then law school, uh, had a lot of opportunities uh, 40 plus years ago when he came out of law school. Uh, and yet uh, he chose to go to the time what was a small law firm in Palo Alto focused on growth capital. That small law firm in Palo Alto, Wilson Sonsini, became one of the most powerful, one of the most important law firms in the entire world as it relates to growth capital, of which Bob Ladder was one of the senior most partners and intimately involved in every M&A, every growth capital financing, every financing opportunity, as well as every failure one might imagine, given the nature of Silicon Valley. Uh, I've known Bob and his wife for 30 plus years. Again, I count him as a very, very good friend, a very trusted advisor. He's a partner at Pegasus. He's our general counsel at Pegasus, and he's a significant investor. And so I couldn't be more happy about having Bob on the board um, on a going forward basis, I would expect that you will see other board initiatives that have a tie into the UAE, a tie into industry. Uh, so that will likely be where we uh, where we add on a going forward basis. Uh, Gabby, remind me. Uh, I want to make sure I hit these questions beyond yeah. the board. What were the questions? Uh, it's it's referring to. Um the cash burn rate, what's the current burn rate? Yep. And yep. are you expecting to issue uh, 3DA equity to a funding partner for working capital? Great. Okay. So the uh, we, we, we ended the quarter, I don't know exactly where the cash will be, but when you have essentially the adjusted cash 
for a bunch of things that were happening right at the end of the quarter, we're going to effectively have about $11.6 million of cash at the end of the quarter. Our burn rate is on the order of 800,000 uh, per month. Um, there are certain months it's lumpy because we have some projects going on. So we retain Frost Sullivan as announced. Uh, this is a very in-depth market research analysis as well as technical review, feasibility analysis that will also be used in conjunction with Emirates Development Bank. Uh, we've retained Corn Ferry making two very key hires for us. So we've got some lumpiness and some expenses that come along there. But if you think 800,000 to a million a month, uh, I think that's a, a fair uh, anticipatory number for our burn rate. As I said, I could pick up the phone today uh, with contacts of mine and bring in equity capital tomorrow. Uh, we do not need and we do not want straight financing capital. I certainly do not expect to go to the market and raise dilutive capital, i.e. at a discount. Rather, what I want to do, I think we've got an unbelievable long-term opportunity. I want to, quote, unquote, take that opportunity to strategic partners, quote, unquote, invite them to be a shareholder in this business, convince that we have a very interesting long-term opportunity uh, and where they can add value beyond simply investing. And that is likely how we will raise capital, uh, call it over the next 18 months, uh, as we stand up the first facility and stand up the first installation of equipment. Uh, so that would be my expectation for financing. That would include a mix of working capital and CapEx. Um, but candidly, if you look at what is needed over that 18 month period of time, it's not a uh, significant number. And, and thus I can say with conviction, as I said earlier, it would not be our anticipation to imminently raise capital. It certainly would not be our anticipation to raise capital at a discount. Uh, we will do so strategically, and we will do so when it enables us to bring on the cap table a partner who can add value beyond just capital. Thanks, Hank. Um, next question is from Mook, and he asks, are you a buyer of the stock at the current price? Uh, so I obviously have to be careful on what I disclose there. Um, I made an explicit comment in my remarks. I feel the stock is undervalued at the current level. Um, as some will recall, um, uh, Pegasus does have firm approval to increase its shareholdings. Um, to the extent I do so, there's well-established disclosure requirements and certainly those will be met. Okay, thanks. That's all the questions for now. Um, just one comment from, from one person on the call from Tim. He just wants to thank you, Hank, for your dedication and work ethic, and maybe you should take a holiday over the Easter break. Um, and with that comment, I'll pass to you for closing. Thanks, Hank. Yes, Tim, uh, my wife would welcome your email. She, she feels the same, but the truth is, for better or for worse, there's nothing I'm more enjoyed than this. And um, look, it's not without its challenges, and I promise you that we will have more. And I want to be very careful in no way. Uh, the, the, it's one thing. It's one thing to have to come back and candidly report inevitable setbacks and frustrations uh, to investors. And I've done so and I'll continue to do so. Uh, and I can, it's not pleasant, but I can handle that. Uh, it would be far worse in my mind if ever investors had the impression we would say anything to quote unquote appease them and or try to somehow uh, um, create an overly confident picture of this company. Uh, we will not do that going forward. We will try to provide a balanced view. Uh, and yet let my action speak for my confidence I have in this business and where we are. Uh, and, um, you know, the last thing that I'll say in closing, I want partners and shareholders. I want to know our largest 20 shareholders. I want to frequently hear from them and get feedback. Um, and on a going forward basis, I want alignment with those shareholders recognizing again, I don't care about this quarter particularly as it relates to stock price. What I care about is that we execute. What I care about is we make progress on these deliverables. If we do that, the stock price will take care of itself. If that's in alignment, the way you as an investor look at things, please join us. Please remain a shareholder. Please increase your shareholdings. If that's not the way you look at things, 
if instead you're looking at a single quarter event driven, this is not the right company to invest in and you will become very frustrated. And uh, again, it's my intent to be very candid with everyone on, on that score. Um, Gabby, I see a hand up. Do we have yeah, anyone? Sorry, um, Phil's got a question. Phil Kaywood oh, from great. Hack Partners. Uh, Phil, please go ahead. Hi, Hank. How are you? Good, Phil. Good. Good to hear from you. Um, I just question, obviously, I don't know, maybe I'm a gauge for the market. Everyone was a little bit disappointed reading that the original joint venture um, funding, you know, circa 300 million of CapEx or OPEX to get into production was terminated or, as you say, kind of changed and deviated, if you like. Um, it's kind of better than ever, you know, sticking with your partner. So it's a, it's a game and bold move by you to, to terminate and go in your new direction. You've answered some of these questions uh, which, which people have asked, but um, Obviously, you've got to get funding in line. Practically, you've got to get funding in line, which you seem confident with some some debt providers. It looks like you're going to capitalise all your fit out costs for the factory. Um, <clears throat> sort of reading between the lines it's, and getting two atomizers in place, looks like you'll get the capex requirement to get stage one in place is a lot less than originally budgeted. Um, can you just sort of talk through, I guess, the expanding strategy, assuming, well, let's, we, we all know what can happen. No deal goes ahead. That's the most negative view we can have. But if you go forward, you get the funding in place, you, you execute as you seem determined to do. Um, can you just sort of talk us through, you know, you've gone to 100% effectively or 98% of the well, 100% of project level, 98% equity, once you give away the percentages. So are you, is the vision now get the company gets 100% of a, initially a smaller project and then that's the landing had to expand, potentially you know, sell half the business at a, a lot larger valuation to a bigger organisation and keep pushing with that vertical integration into the, uh, the whole titanium supply in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, Phil, it, it, essentially you hit on the most insightful question, right? When we, had, when we first announced this project with a joint venture partner, it was announced as a $300 million project. It was announced as seven atomizers in commercialization and large 3D printing. Today, we're talking about four titanium atomizers. What happened? Why, right? Why do you go from 300 million to four atomizers? And what's the difference in the CapEx? When we were talking to our JV partners, what was very important to them is they wanted to see these in-country capabilities, okay, relating to 3D printing, related to added manufacturing, related to advanced materials, uh, and all of which, of course, are good businesses, relatively speaking. As that partnership fell through, as I had to turn back to standing up capital, there's two considerations I have. Most importantly, we've got to green light this first project because that then establishes the platform to do all these other things and provides that credibility in the marketplace as well as with our investors. So number one, I've got to get started. Number two, I want to focus on the highest returning, okay? Best payback period capital assets to start with. If you look at the powder production side for titanium, whether it's titanium or whether it's specialty alloys such as titanium aluminite, whatever the case may be, we're going to be at about a 26% net margin business, right? You look at a lot of businesses. Tell me how many businesses that you see have a net margin of 26%. Now, it's not the fallacy that had been talked about before as far as there's a six-month payback period. BS, excuse my French. It'll take us, without a partner, it would take us two years to qualify this powder. I think with a partner, and this is, as you might imagine, something we're working on, we'll be able to accelerate that. But in a conservative scenario, it will take us four years to break even. I think that number is more like three years to break even when you bring in this partner. By focusing on those four atomizers, I can bring my CapEx from 300 million all the way down to 75 million. Let me repeat that. I bring my CapEx from 300 million all the way down to 75 million. And before where I was talking about 
uh, I think it was $200 million of top line revenue. I'm now going to be at about $150 million of top line revenue, right? So I spend a small fraction of the CapEx. I get the large majority of my top line and I get most of my bottom line given this part of the operation has the highest net return. And so it's all about capital allocation. It's all about how do we create and maintain this mindset of scarcity of capital in a very disciplined way, put money to work, along the way, minimizing dilution everywhere that we can. And in doing so, yes, I think when this first project is fully funded on a fully diluted basis, I think we'll be left with more than 50% of the economics. And whether that's structured as attractive debt, whether that's structured as equity, whatever the capital structure is, I think it will be accretive to Ameri shareholders versus what it would have been in the Robbed and JV. On top of that, it gives us more flexibility going forward. We gave them something of enormous value, which was exclusivity and exclusivity in the Middle East. That exclusivity is now reverted to us, right? No longer do we have an exclusive partner in the Middle East. As you might imagine, uh, we're getting frequent, out, frequent outreach from parties in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, elsewhere in the Middle East. Most importantly, we stand up this first project. I do not expect that's going to take significant capital raise to do so, and I'm highly confident we'll get there. Thanks, uh, Hank. And in your release, I think you mentioned today as well that you hope to uh, green light the project by June 30 um, with the, the ports or signing the lease with your, your uh, warehouse partner. Um, do we assume that you'll have the uh, banking partners, whether it's debt, equity, whatever it may be, to fund that by June? I'm just trying to understand where we should look to the new uh, significant data event sort of driven outcome is it sort of, are we putting a line in the sand for June 30 at this point? Yeah, I am. A, look, the reason I give these self-imposed deadlines is I want to create an urgency within our organization. I want to create accountability and deliverables that we've got to deliver on. I'm doing the same thing with other discussions we're having with strategic partners and so forth. So by the end of June, <clears throat> the end of the physical year, what do we expect? I expect that we will have a sign binding lease. Why does that matter? This is a significant capital investment on behalf of Abu Dhabi ports. Okay, uh, They are going to capitalize 100% of the project development cost, a greenfield build a suit location, custom built location, and 100% of the fit out cost. All right, will be capitalized in the lease. On top of that, given the break even period that we will have, it will accommodate us with a, a free rent period. I've got a pretty good sense of what that will be, uh, but to be determined as far as exactly. Essentially, they're coming in uh, as a partial equity partner, given the economics of that lease. Moreover, this is the premier industrial park area uh, in the Middle East, certainly in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, et cetera. Uh, and Captain Al-Shamsi, um, I, 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 I would state as the single strongest executive I've seen in the Middle East. Uh, he's recognized as that in Abu Dhabi as being an incredibly well-respected executive. Um, and they are, by the way, AD Ports was an ADQ. Those of you who might know, this is a large sovereign wealth fund. They were an ADQ company funded by ADQ that went public about 15 months ago. And the, so there's some very interesting things they're working on strategically as well. They'll be a great partner. At the time we sign that lease, we certainly will want to have funding in place that gives us a significant runway. What is that at the time? 12 to 18 months. I don't want to raise any more capital than I have to to be confident I can meet all my funding obligations. Uh, uh, obviously, as time goes by, I expect to be less dilutive. I expect to be, have a higher share price as I meet these milestones. And so we'll be very tactful about the way that we raise capital when we raise capital, making sure we always have adequate capital runway, uh, but at the same time, not raising more capital than we have to that would create unnecessary dilution. So stay tuned. Um, but yes, I would expect to see more announcements on that front between now and the end of June. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Phil. 
Um, Anyone Hank, else? There's one more last question. Um, this is from Tom Hank. Uh, and Tom asks, given the number and the complexity of the key task at hand, approvals, securing capital and strategic partners, are you being pulled in too many directions and do you have enough senior staff to assist? Yeah, <laughs> these are all great, really insightful questions. Uh, yes, I'm being pulled in too many directions. Yes, I've got incredible senior staff today. And by the way, I think the senior team has really grown a lot over the last six months. Um, yes, we need more. Um, most importantly, and this will be a very important hire force, uh, we have, as announced, retained Corn Ferry. The, the two immediate hires they will make will be a, gen a general manager of powder metallurgy slash powder production operations. Uh, they will essentially run the business in Abu Dhabi. We're looking to bring in someone who not only has got very strong powder metallurgy background, but also very strong manufacturing background within the ecosystem. So you can think of the well-known companies they might come from. I think it's quite likely someone would come from Europe is where we will likely recruit from. We have very strong industry in Sweden and Germany in particular. Uh, and so, look, I, my, my nature is, I am going to obsess over every detail and I will be involved in all the details that matter. But, and we've tried to um, shepherd capital the best that we can. And thus we've been very reluctant to spend more capital until we stand this project up, but we need to expand our team and we will expand the team. We'll also be in the market to hire a great CFO. Um, this is the other corn ferry uh, replacement and uh, think of someone who's got a strong FP&A financial planning analysis background, someone who brings his credibility with the public market, and someone who can work very well with these strategic partners. Um, so we're on top of it. We've got a great team. Uh, John McKellar here has done a great job. Uh, it's been great to see uh, Barry in Australia and Ken in the U.S. really extend their role. And I think, uh, you know, I've been really pleased to see them participate in ways with, a, with the issue of how can I be helpful, right? How can I be helpful? This is not about a siloed organization. This is not about various PLs. The, the organizational imperative is we have to start this project. It will then give us credibility to move on to these more ambitious projects. And that's the singular focus. We'll deliver whatever re resources we need to do so. Okay. Everyone, thank you very much for the time. Uh, thank you very much for your trust and confidence. And uh, we will uh, certainly speak about a month from now uh, as we report quarterly results. And at that time, we will host another investor briefing. Thanks again, Gabby. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, everyone.